Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutun. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Previous state elections suggest that Chinese voters' sentiment have shifted, either towards indifference or against parties they voted for in GE14. But today on the show, we take a deeper look into the assumptions being made about how Chinese, how the Chinese community relates to political dynamics. Joining us now is James Chin, Professor of Asian Studies at University of Tasmania in Australia. James, um, we often talk about uh, ethnic groups as though they are homogenous. But I'm just wondering, in terms of gauging sentiment, do we need to make a distinction, particularly in terms of class or gender or even location in Sabah and Sarawak versus, say, the peninsula? Is it still, or, or on the flip side, do you think it's still productive to speak about Malaysian Chinese um, as, as, a, as a group? So I think the starting point is that all the issues that you mentioned, all the factors you mentioned, like class, location, all those plays a factor in the political socialization process. So it's obvious that uh, like the Malay community, there's no such thing as a typical Chinese voters. Uh, however, in terms of the issues, uh, increasingly the sort of political issues facing the Chinese community uh, are sort of becoming uh, more common on the same platform. Uh, but in terms of the uh, voting outcome, it is true what you said, especially we saw that very clearly in Malacca, Sarawak and Johor, where the Chinese voters who used to vote for Pakatan Harapan a significant portion of them have voted uh, for the Barisan National or GPS in recent elections. Um, the other point to note is that because of the low turnout, uh, we can regard that these are what we call the hardcore voters. In other words, they will come out for whatever elections. So the reason why there's a lot of interest in this group is because we expect them to come up for GE15 as well. James, you could just carry on with uh, Melissa's question and, and I, I ask you whether, say, for instance, the circumstances of the Chinese community in Sarawak and how, how different it is from the peninsula in terms of uh, the Sarawak government's policies on Chinese education, uh, the strength of, say, the education, Chinese education system in Sarawak, um, uh, the, the general sentiment that Sarawak... Uh, uh, has a different approach to ethnic relations and so on and so forth. Does that make a difference to the way in which the Chinese of Sarawak think of themselves as opposed to those who live under, you know, Ketuanan Melayu in uh, Malaya? Uh, yes, the answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, but the way to understand the Chinese political thinking in Sarawak is that uh, for the Chinese in Sarawak and also for the Chinese in Sabah, uh, they feel that they're living in a much more privileged position because they're not directly under the so-called Amno Sekatuanan Melayu philosophy. Uh, but having said that, you have to remember in Sarawak, uh, the overriding factor for the Chinese over there is basically a move towards full autonomy. So what they want is consistent with the wider political feeling in Sarawak, that Sarawak really wants its own political culture. They want to ring fence at Sarawak from all the influences or so-called bad influences of Peninsula Malaysia politics. The other important point to remember when it comes to the Sarawak Chinese is that unlike the Chinese in other states, uh, Sarawak Chinese always had the uh, so-called uh, advantage of, of splitting the vote. In other words, in Sarawak, because you have separate parliamentary elections and separate state elections. So in terms of the parliamentary elections, they will look more towards national policies. In terms of the state election, they'll look at the status of the Chinese uh, at the state level. So because of that, uh, it also affects the way they think about politics. But I think going forward, in terms of GE15, um, I think what will happen with the electorate in GE15, and this is not only for the Chinese, this is for, for the whole Malaysian community, is that you have to remember the last two years of lockdown in Malaysia has really changed the way people think about politics. So GE15 will not be a normal election because you're talking about the entire voting population that is coming out of, of lockdown and also the big numbers of people coming in to vote for the very first time. What, what, do, you mean, what do you mean by that, James? Sorry, just could you elaborate? What do you mean that the pandemic has changed the way people view voting? Sure. I'm talking about people, the way, not, not the way they view voting, but the way they think about politics. 
Uh, one of the reasons why people think differently about politics is that uh, most people do not realize that the pandemic has really uh, affected the Malaysian economy very, very deeply. Uh, you know, I was shocked. I mean, I was really, really shocked that, you know, even in urban uh, middle class neighborhood at one time, people were flying flats because they said they've run out of food, things like that. You don't expect the middle class to be so affected. So basically, the way to understand what is happening in terms of, of, of uh, the rice bowl is that uh, before the pandemic, uh, the general consensus was that you can sort of divide the Malaysian uh, uh, society into the top 20%, middle 40%, bottom 40%. And uh, now most people will tell you, those, especially those in the NGO will tell you that the number of bottom 40 has actually moved to probably uh, bottom 60. So the middle class has been shaved back to 20 uh, the top segment is still 20%. Uh, you all know, right? This is this is true for Malaysia as in everywhere else. Uh, your rice bowl really affect the way you think about politics and also affect the way you vote. So my argument is that coming to GE15, uh, people will think about politics differently and they will vote differently uh, because we've come back to normality after two years of lockdown. James, you know, the larger question of uh, equal citizenship, right? The The... the aspiration that Malaysia moves beyond the Bumiputra, non-Bumiputra uh, policies that have shaped the, you know, post-independence Malaysia for, you know, what now, six decades or so. Is that something that the Chinese community still aspires to, or is there a deep resignation? As we know, the brain drain and the millions that have left the country over the decades, uh, is there a resignation that uh, equality of citizenship will never be recognized in Malaysia? Uh, yes, I think there is both a change and continuity. In terms of the continuity, I think for the, uh, uh, the so-called older Malaysians, uh, most of them take a very pessimistic view of Malaysia. Uh, they think that the non-Malays will never be regarded as political equals in Malaysia. So basically, if you look back at the Chinese community in Malaysia for the last 60 years, uh, basically the, the two big segments is, the first segment says that in order to bring change, you have to work with the Malay government in power. Whoever is in power on the Malay side, you work with them. And you know, there are plenty of uh, Malaysian Chinese tycoon, you can see the pattern working closely with Amno, whoever is in power, to bring small changes within the system because they think over the long run, uh, the Malay elites themselves will understand that the multiracial is the way to go in Malaysia. Uh, the other group, of course, is the group who says that there is no hope because the Ketuana Melayu Islam is almost impossible. No matter what we do, we can't do anything. That is the group that has uh, largely, if they can do it, uh, they will leave Malaysia. And those businessmen who think that it's so difficult to work in the Malay community, uh, most of them will have expanded overseas. So these are the two large groups. In terms of the trend uh, among the Chinese community, I see several trends. Uh, some of them actually contradict each other. So for example, it is also true that younger Chinese are also getting less racial in their approach. Uh, they realize that if we keep following this uh, racial uh, lens in terms of politics, it's not gonna go anywhere. It's just gonna make the divide even worse. So in some ways, the younger Chinese are becoming uh, less racial. They are also becoming more socially conscious you can see that uh, more and more uh, younger Chinese are getting themselves involved in uh, NGO with political leanings. Uh, in some ways, they're also getting more religious. They're getting more and more involved in religious affairs. Um, of course, uh, what you mentioned about talent going overseas, I don't think that is going to stop. Uh, the reason is because in addition to, to politics or so-called second-class citizenship, uh, there were too many uh, push factors. Uh, for example, a lot of them are worried about, you know, education if i get married what sort of education can i provide for my children uh the sort of income career progression all that sort of thing uh sort of has a as a equally strong push uh together the racial thing so that's why i think that they will uh that they will move regardless uh the other very clear trend in the chinese community heading forward is that increasingly the younger chinese are, are selecting what they call, among the Chinese, they call it quality over quantity. In other words, they're having less number of children. So it is quite remarkable. My generation, uh, now you get to know how old I really am. <laughs> the Chinese will probably have somewhere between, uh, you know, between three to five children or three to four. Uh, it is very clear that the younger Chinese moving forward, those who are sort of getting married now, 
uh, they're thinking maximum of two. Some of them will probably even go for one. So they're sort of saying that, you know, life is difficult. Uh, we are sort of restricted in our environment. It's better we only have one child so we can put all the resources in a private education, better quality of life. Yeah. So those are the sort of things happening within the Chinese community. Now, although a lot of these things on the surface doesn't look like it is uh, related to politics, uh, but the problem in Malaysia is that everything in Malaysia is political. Uh, there's nothing that you can argue or you can argue with me that you know nothing is political. I mean, a perfect example of that is, uh, you know, uh, right now we have a big debate in Malaysia over this issue of, uh, you know, young children going out bicycling three o'clock in the morning, right? Uh, in any other countries, this will be seen as a road safety issue. But in Malaysia, it is, well, a big segment of the community right. is trying to play out the racial angle. Right. Uh, can I just ask you very quickly before, we've got a couple of minutes, and I just want to uh, ask you about what you said in this, at the start of the conversation. You pointed to some hardcore voters who will come out to vote no matter what. But there seems to be also a large segment of the Chinese community who are either indifferent or don't see an option that's, that they, they want to participate, that makes them want to participate in the democratic process. Can I ask you, how do, what, what would might shift that? What might shift the fence sitters, so to speak, uh, within the Chinese community to want to participate or even to, to side one party or the other? So, in fact, I, I think uh, what you said uh, is not really correct because in 2018, they came out in really, really large numbers. That's the reason why people talk about 90% of the Chinese voted for the DAP or for the opposition. So, it's, it really depends on, on, on GE15, whether the Chinese or the non malays in general think that their vote matters or whether it's a done deal for Barisan National Amno to come back. If they feel that you know, their vote really matters and that we are likely to see again within the Malay community a deep split, and this is where the non malays can play a crucial role when it comes to the uh, government formation after the election. If they feel that they can play a big role, they will come out and vote. Uh, voters usually don't come out and vote if they feel that their vote doesn't matter. So like 2018, they really felt that their vote matter. In fact, in 2018, they felt that the vote matter so much that they even organized for overseas Malaysians, who we know is a code word for non malays to come back and vote. So it really depends on, 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 you know, when the election is called, what sort of mood we have in the country, whether people think that this is really election that, uh, you know, that has profound consequences or this election really matters as in choosing the next government. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Political analyst, Jay, Professor James Chin there. And we're going to take a quick break here and consider this. We'll be back with more. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for staying with Shred and I on Consider This. Let's continue our discussion about voting trends among the Chinese community. Are the assumptions that voter sentiment has shifted? Uh, are those assumptions accurate? Let's ask our next guest, Tan, Tan Sing Kiat. He is the research manager at the opinion research firm Merdeka Centre. Sing Kiat, has Merdeka Centre looked at sentiment among Chinese voters recently? And I'm just wondering what your opinion polls say, um, whether they confirm that, in fact, uh, sentiment among the Chinese community has, in fact, shifted either towards indifference or, toward, uh, or against the parties that they once voted for in GE14. Um, if, let's say, we look at our opinion poll, or let's say we zoom in on the Chinese uh, voters, but the Chinese voter, I will, I must uh, emphasize that it's not homogeneous, where it's different by the generation, by the also the, the geography di different. Uh, the Chinese from Sabah Sarawak will be quite different from the Chinese from the peninsula, let's say, uh, between Klang Valley and also Johor. But if, let's say, I would say that... Um, is there any change towards the 2018 election will be that the enthusiasm towards the politics or maybe there are some political fatigues uh, for, since the 2018 election where the high expectations, the change of government and the theme or the key issue that concerns the Chinese community as a general uh, across the different generation actually about the fairness 
the from the government from the system itself where i think the team is still there just that maybe they are a bit uh, disappointed or a bit fatigued about the infighting who happened over the years rather than uh, and they think there's a lot of things been promised uh the reform have not been uh complete or been the store halfway or not been carried out stuff like that so there's a disappointment political fatigue and also uh there are some who say um they feel that uh, there's a long way to go on the, on on what they want. Thank yeah. you. Have you uh, you know discerned uh, generational differences? I mean, I know these are all rather broad generalizations, but right. are there some uh, you know worthwhile insights that we can glean from the data that tell us about generational differences? Um, beside the generation, I think the occupation also play a, a, a little bit of the role. Generation, I was I will use a line of 60, 60 years old and and uh, and, be, and below six, uh, 60, uh, 40 to sixty and below forty. There's three tier, and those sixty and above, I think a lot of them will be still have some fond memory about MCA who are uh, in the past may help them in, in the uh, in the past uh, throughout their life. But uh, that's why they're still sizable uh, Chinese or older Chinese who are still support for the MC or Baisa National. But come to the mid age of 40 to uh, 60, which are the group are more critical, where they will have uh, quite such, uh, they kind of mix where between they have some communal view at the same time, they also uh, want a good governance, fairness from the system itself. Where the, those people 40 and below, um, generally they are talking more the universal value kind of things, uh, good governance issue, and um, and this uh, economic policy and stuff like that. So uh, there's a quite different between the, those below 40 and those above 60. Those above 60, they were probably uh, because of the background. A lot of them are mother tongues, uh, language by nature. Uh, I mean, Mandarin or dialects uh, is for for. The, the those 17 above will mostly will be in a dialect uh, groups so and not even the Mandarin. So they will slightly have a more emphasis on the more community issue like language, culture, stuff like that. Where the mid age will be start uh, in between about the cultural identity politics and also the, the system itself, the fairness, the economic policy and stuff like that. And the younger generation where we most of us grew up in the so-called Scholar Kambasans, uh, Scholar Menengah Kambasans, primary school, maybe uh, vernacular school, but uh, secondary school, mostly in the so-called Scholar Kambasan. So we will have a quite mi kind of mix, uh, will be more universal value in driven in a sense. So this is kind of generation gap. But the, uh, along all this way, but there's still a one important um, line, a fault, fault line you know, among the Chinese will be that uh, they feel being discriminated uh, and especially those people who are grow up under the NEP, where they at least will be discriminating once in their lifetime when they want to enter university. Mm -hmm. So if even before that, uh, they may have a good friends, good relationship in the high school with all their friends from all the background. But when you go through that uh, university entrance uh, experience, people feel that they at least discriminate once. So this is something the fairness of um, that, that people expecting to be fixed uh, uh, after the 2018 election, which, uh, but ed education reform in kind of long haul, we have to incorporate the view from all the, everyone, all the aspects uh, and from the right. aspects and not only the populist uh, views on, on that. So, Sinke, can I ask you um, what perhaps the data might show of how important leadership may be to, to the Chinese community when it informs their voting decisions. Leadership, not just of political parties, but leadership of at the national level, at the federal level, prime minister candidate. Um, how, does that factor highly in voting decisions? Um, I think most likely they were vote based on the values. I would say that uh, uh, the value that I mentioned before, good governance, uh, the corruption. Because in our survey, Chinese always mentioned about corruption. So it's a major issue of the country. Second, it will be economic development and so on. So I think they are mostly uh, value-based. But leaders play an important role in mobilizing and rally the supporter. If I say you have a leader that can mobilize uh, the, the, the supporter or can bring up the emotions, one thing I would say is the emotions uh, uh, actions. If let's say you can bring out the emotion of the supporter, then yeah, the turnout rate will be higher. And what we observed in the last two, three state election is that the the there's no enthusiasm to votes because people say that ah, 
whether I vote or not, there's no, no different kind of thing. So there's no, the, none of the leader can mobilize the supporter. But if you ask me about it, uh, mostly the, the fundamental value that I mentioned, the fairness and all the good governance issue are still there, still in play. So okay, whichever yeah. party will provide that mm-hmm. platform will still capture their support. But whether they will turn out to vote, I think it still kind of it depends on the sentiment, the COVID, the leadership you mentioned. Yep. Correct. Yeah, so, so you say, get, you know, uh, talking about party politics and where people might uh, uh, choose, right? And you're talking about sentiments versus maybe, you know, some rational uh, d- uh, choice uh, being made over, you know, political parties. But I want to ask you about sentiment towards the country as a whole. Um, is there pessimism or optimism about Malaysia's future? And to what extent do we know if people are thinking that leaving Malaysia is really the best choice for them personally, that they will uh, prosper uh, as an you know, individual or uh, as families if they leave Malaysia? Okay, the pessimism about the country from the Chinese community, I think it starts deterring after the 2015 to 2016 uh, uh, time, when that is the so-called the GST, where the economics really punish the people as a whole, and especially on the uh, everyone. Then at the same time, we have YNDBs, uh, which so-called the global scandals uh, developing when it comes to the ears and uh, eyes of the people. So the so the pessimism is very, very low. So only like less than 10% of the Chinese respondents will say that they are think the country is heading in the right direction. But this flits during the 2018 uh, election when people think that, oh, there's a change, there's an opportunity to change that. But after one year down the road, after one year Pakistan in the picture, then the sentiments start teetering. And that's uh, become, again, back to the 2016 kind of scenario after, during the first half of the 2020 when the COVID started. And also the where the Sheraton moves, the change of government happened. So that moves and ha- haven't changed much. But um, but relate to your another question about uh, migrate side, right? um, I think that question will be high during the 216, 217. I have some older data, which I cannot remember the figures. As uh, Compared to all the community, the Malaysian Chinese will be the higher uh, inclination that they say that uh, they were thinking to uh, move out from the country. For the better job, for the better career, for the better, uh, for the better of the country, and so on. Mm-hmm. So, but that sentiment um, is come down after the two one election. I think this sentiment again will, will rise again during the co- uh, during the COVID time and also uh, during the so after post the Sheraton move. That sentiment right. is still there, but it's dif- also again different from uh, senti- uh, from the generation. Only always are the older generation like my parent generation will encourage the children, hey, you better go and find a job in Singapore. Or <laughs> so I think the kind of, um, um, if, if it's kind of com- uh, during the family gathering, Lunar New Year or like Mid-Autumn Festival and get family gathering, it's something you say, oh, this is kind of recurrent theme. Uh, why not right. a better, uh, greener posture elsewhere in Singapore, or down south and Australia and so on. So it's kind okay. of a regular okay. theme. Okay, can I ask you, in a couple of minutes that we have left, are Chinese voters um, set in perhaps who they want to vote for? Um, or are m- many Chinese voters still uh, fence-sitters or undecided as, as, as at this point? I think they know who they don't want to vote. I think they're quite clear. Uh, they know that the which leader or which party, they are fed up and disappointed. They don't want to vote. Then at the same time, they also feel that uh, the other guy is not up to their standard. So, the 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 intention to get out the to voting is probably lower than the previous like two, even lower than the two thousand thirteen elections. Definitely will lower than the two thousand eighteen election. Will be lower than two uh, the GE thirteen the two thousand thirteen election. So the turnout rate will be quite low. And okay, then the, for the last year, we saw observed on some of the state elections where low turnout, COVID will be one of the important issue. If let's say general election in Q3, Q4, I think COVID no longer an issue and borders open. So how many Malaysian, uh, we've been told an official figure, half a million Malaysian Chinese working in Singapore, are they coming back? So they will also would, would change the, the out election outcome. I see. All right. Sengkiat, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Tan Sengkiat from Merdeka Centre there, wrapping up this episode of Consider This. 
I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sherrod Kutin signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night. Thank you.